Good morning to everyone joining us from all over the world. We're very delighted to be here this morning to have a truly international panel to discuss a very exciting and really important contribution, not only to scholarship, but to um, broader thinking about the right to equality. And of course, we're here this morning to celebrate the launch of Dr. Victoria Miandazi's new monograph, Equality in Kenya's 2010 Constitution, Competing and Interrelated Conceptions. To introduce myself, I am uh, Dr. Megan Campbell. I'm a senior lecturer at the University of Birmingham and uh, the deputy director of the Oxford Human Rights Hub. And I am one of your moderators for this morning's panel. I'm delighted to be joined by my co-moderator, Dr. Duncan Okubasu, and I'll turn to him to introduce him, himself. Uh, welcome participants. As uh, Megan has pointed out, my name is Duncan Okubasu, and uh, I am a lecturer at uh, the Department of Public Law at Moy University. This morning, I'll be a uh, co-moderator, and uh, I welcome you to this event. Uh, back to you, uh, Megan. Great. For those participating, please do put your questions, comments, thoughts in the YouTube uh, chat function. We'll be collecting them at the end for a um, question and answer session. And because we have such a wonderful and stellar lineup of speakers, we'll start right off and I'll turn to Duncan to introduce our first very, very uh, honored speaker. Thank you, Megan, and it's uh, really my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker who will give us the keynote speech. And that's none other than the uh, retired uh, Chief Justice of Kenya. Uh, it's, it's really my pleasure to introduce him. Um, I'm sure that we have heard something about, or we, we have heard actually about him, or we did hear much about him, particularly in 2017. He is, uh, needs no introduction, but uh, the much I can say is that he is um, a retired judge of the Supreme Court, president of the Supreme Court, uh, retired president of the Supreme Court, and was actually uh, Kenya's Chief Justice, and the second Chief Justice after uh, retired Chief Justice Mutunga. He is a fellow of the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, uh, London. And uh, before joining the judiciary, he had been a private practitioner for over 25 years. He was appointed a judge of the Supreme of the High Court in 2002 or three, and then to the Court of Appeal subsequently. And uh, at the time he was retiring, he had been, as I mentioned, the uh, Chief Justice and President of the Supreme Court. He has uh, received quite numerous um, uh, recognitions because of his defense of uh, the rule of law. So uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce, uh, I mean, to invite the Chief Justice to give us uh, his speech. Welcome, uh, CJ. Thank you, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, Conrad and uh, all the organizers, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Yes, thank you very much. I am. Uh, honored and privileged to uh, be in this function. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly happy that uh, I'm able to be invited to such a functions. They give me an opportunity to dust my suits and uh, put them on. As you know, in retirement life, you, you want it to be as casual as possible. And also to, 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 to engage, I'm, uh, I'm quite happy to be here this morning. It gives me great pleasure to join you this morning as we launch a very important and a timely publication on an equally important subject. Before I make my brief remarks on the book that we are about to launch today, let me take this opportunity to congratulate you, uh, Victoria. Thank you on the strides and the pro uh, progress that you have made in your professional development and the scaling up the academic ladder. For those of you who do not know, uh, Dr. Miyandasi is a young scholar who is currently a law lecturer at Embu uh, University, an associate at uh, Okubasu, you, I mean Okubasu is, 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 is with us here, Munene and uh, Kasungu uh, advocates, as well as a researcher at the Oxford Human Rights Hub. 
Within a short time, Dr. Miyandasi has achieved great milestones. She holds a Doctor of Philosophy in Law, Master of Philosophy in Law, and a Bachelor of, uh, of Law from the University of, uh, of uh, from Kenyatta University. The other three are from the uh, uh, University of Oxford. I have known Dr. Miyandasi since uh, 2012, when she joined us in the Judicial Working Committee on Election Preparations, which later came to be known as the Judiciary Committee on Elections. Uh, she did uh, wonderful work with us there. And there's somebody I always relied upon whenever I needed something uh, to be done urgently. I'm glad that you, uh, Daktari, you, you, you went on to further your studies and that you have become a celebrated scholar whose work we are recognizing today. Congratulations on your great achievements and on your book that we are launching today. In August this year, Kenya's constitution uh, will be just over a decade old. The country has spent the last 10 years implementing the transformative agenda that is contained in the constitution with varying successes. While a decade is a relatively short time to expect a complete and holistic transformation, it is equally a safe and appropriate time to have a general picture and the parcel of how the fundamental pillars of the constitution uh, transformation are evolving. As Dr. Miyandasi has pointed out in our introductory remark, uh, parts of the book, the specific issues and the principles that the constitution has dealt with in a, a, in a deep, detailed and uh, multifaceted manner is the principle of equality, the national values, and the principles of governance and list among the core um, constitutional values to include equity, social justice, inclusiveness, equality, human rights, non-discrimination, and the protection of the marginalized, among other values. These principles are further cascaded to different aspects of constitutional governance and through the mandate and the responsibilities of different bodies. Before speaking briefly on the contents of the book, it is important to always remind ourselves of the constitutional journey that this country has trudged. Before the adoption, of the current constitution in 2010, Kenya had gone through more than two decades of constitutional making, including an unsuccessful referendum in 2005. The post-election violence that was witnessed in the country uh, in 2007-2008 was the turning point. It brought with it the agency to adopt a new constitution as one of the long-term goals to ensure political stability. More importantly, inequalities in access to opportunities perceived in ethno-geographical dimensions were identified, identified as the, the main underlying causes of the violence. It is therefore no surprise that Kenyans overwhelmingly voted in favor of the 2010 constitution signaling a rebirth of the nation with a strong emphasis on equality and the redressing of past injustices. I'm hearing some echo, I don't know whether... The premise of uh, Dr. Miyandasi's treatise is to inquire into the constitutional treatment and application of the concept, whether there is a coherent conception of uh, equality in Kenya's 2010 constitution and explores how competing and interrelated ideas of equality are designed in the constitution and how they are understood 
and given meaning through implementation. Inevitably, and as the book clearly uh, demonstrates, the complexity and the potential contradictions in meaning and application of the multifaceted concept of equality calls for coherence, both in construct, constructing and uh, constructing the meaning and or meanings, and most importantly, in pursuit of the concrete goals and the purposes in the constitution. This debate and discussion on the meaning and application of the concept of equality and its related constitutional uh, concepts is born within a certain context, comparative and, uh, and local. The comparative treatment of these concepts across time and space is thus ind indispensable. Relevant experiences can shape and guide the construction and application of the concept of equality. Dr. Miyandasi has drawn relevant examples and experiences from other countries, notably the United States of America, the United Kingdom, Canada, South Africa, India, and Botswana. While these countries differ in terms of uh, levels of economic and the social development, social and political diversity, uh, size and numbers, and in other aspects, there are uh, valuable lessons that can be drawn and learned from them and applied to Kenya's process of constitutional governance. Constitutional scholars have commented on how Kenya's constitution as a unique character where a number of provisions provide guidance on how it should be interpreted and construed. This is important given the historical and political context within which the constitution was negotiated and passed. Dr. Miyandasi has identified these provisions and further nuanced them, thereby uh, developing an analytical approach to the concept of equality in the constitution, especially with a view to achieving coherence and harmony in the potentially contradictory provisions and approaches that she has dealt with in the book. The specific issues that she has dealt with in the book include uh, the relationship that exists between gender equality and the recognition of cultural and religious diversity and how a harmonious interpretation can be achieved. The book has also dealt with the complex but mutually reinforcing and essential relationship between socioeconomic rights and the status-based equality. In the book, Dr. Miyandasi interrogates how the interrelationship between socioeconomic and status-based equality arise, arises within the 2010 constitution, its importance and how uh, such a relationship can be discerned in the Kenyan context. An important observation she makes is that the targets of status-based discrimination, for instance, against women and persons with disabilities are usually disproportionately poor relative to the other social groups. While courts are uh, yet to fully clarify the meaning and application of the principle of equality, there are important steps that have uh, been made in the few issues or matters that have come before them. You recall uh, that last year, I advised the president as required by the constitution to dissolve parliament as a result of its failure to pass the legislation required under article 27, uh, sub article eight of the constitution to implement the two thirds gender rule. This was the last step, which was sanctioned under article 26217 of the constitution after parliament ignored its obligation, including court orders directing it to put in place a legal framework for the realization of the gender equality. Furthermore, 
last, uh, the, the, the last case I dealt with before I retired was one concerning the realization of socioeconomic rights. Those in Kenya, you really remember the Mitubel uh, case uh, that was decided late uh, last year. In that case, the Supreme Court made important statements uh, on the constitution and the law relating to the realization of socioeconomic rights arising from long occupation of public land in the country. The Supreme Court also emphasized that there is a space for structural interdicts within the Kenyan system in the enforcement of socioeconomic rights. The court also clarified the place of international law instruments and expanded their application to the realization of socioeconomic rights in Kenya. Dr. Miyandasi notes in her book, as Dr. Miyandasi notes in her book, courts are yet to fully develop jurisprudence that provides clarity on all aspects of equality in the constitution and especially uh, shedding light on the potential conflicts. This may not happen all at once for the reason that the courts deal with very specific issues that come uh, before them and that form the basis of uh, the cases they determine. It will thus take time for each and every aspect of equality to be settled through litigation. However, the duty to implement and uh, interpret the constitution belongs to all arms of government. Many of these aspects can also be realized through the development and implementation of laws and policies by the executive and the legislative arms of uh, government, of course, with the usual review role of the courts coming in wherever laws or actions of the other arms of government are cha challenged before them. The most important contribution uh, to this debate is the fact that scholars such as Dr. Miyandasi have set in motion the debate and thus identified the contours and the boundaries that the executive, the legislature, and the judiciary should interrogate as each arm, of, uh, arm or organ of government pursues its uh, respective mandate. The book by Dr. Miyandasi joins a growing body of scholarship on the 20 the 2010 constitution. It will no doubt go a long way in uh, enriching not only scholarly and in, uh, intellectual discussions regarding constitutional implementation, but also over a sounding board for the actual decisions and measures to be taken uh, into account in the implementation of the constitution. Once again, Dr. Miyandasi, congratulations for this great achievement. And we are, I want to tell you that we are proud of you. And I'm sure your book is going to be a, a resource material for quite a number of uh, judges who decide cases on uh, the issue of equality. Once again, and thank you all for giving me this opportunity. I may not uh, be with you throughout because I have another uh, meeting coming up shortly. So if you see me exit, please don't think that it is because I, I, I didn't regard this as important. It's because of, the, of, of that. Once again, thank you very much. And uh, I'm very happy for this opportunity. Well, thank you so much, Chief Justice, for those very kind and insightful opening remarks that place Dr. Miandazi's work within its historical context. And I yes. think really helpfully frame the conversation we're about to have on the real challenges and opportunities both in theory and in doctrine on constructing and breathing life into the right to equality in Kenya's constitution and how this not only will help bring insight into Kenya's constitution, but how it can also contribute to international and comparative discussions on the right to equality. So thank you so much from all of the organizers and for all of us participating for those very, very kind remarks. And we completely understand that you are, have other engagements. So we appreciate the time you're able to take to this morning. And now it's my very happy task to introduce the author of the book we're talking this morning, Dr. Victoria Miandazi. The chief just gave a, a quick bio of her, so I won't repeat too much of it, 
but Dr. Miandazi has a doctorate from the University of Oxford. She's a law lecturer at the University of Umbu and an associate advocate at Okubus, Okubusu, pardon me, Mununi and Kazungu advocates. She's a current researcher at the Oxford Human Rights Hub. She's also a very dear friend, and it's a great privilege to be able to introduce her to give a few, she's gonna give a few remarks on her own book before we turn over to the um, discussants. And it's such a privilege because I've gotten to see Victoria's thinking, her, her, the hard work and the fruit of all this hard work come together in this very, very insightful monograph. So without further ado, I'll turn over to Dr. Miandazi so she can uh, introduce her scholarship to us. Thank you again, uh, Megan, for the introduction. And thank you so much, Honorable Retired Chief Justice David Maraga, uh, for the powerful and thought-provoking speech that you have just given, uh, as well as for agreeing to be the chief guest for the book launch. And um, so I'd just like to, uh, to state a few remarks about the book and what inspired it. So the inspiration to have a research focus on equality and as well as to have a book on the scene stems from various lived experiences as well as mentors I have had the pleasure of meeting and working with along the way. We have just had from one of them, the Honorable Retired Chief Justice David Maraga, whose speech has so excellently and eloquently captured key aspects of the book. There is also Professor Sandra Fredman, whom we will hear from today, who was my PhD supervisor and is always a guide to me and inspiration. She, has, she walked me into how to put words to an idea, how to be able to translate lived experiences on equality, such as equality and poverty, equality and disability, equality and gender into the language of the law that can be applied in policy, development of legislation, and that could also guide courts in the interpretation of equality concepts. More so, I learned from her how best to talk about inequality in a language that is easy to understand, not just for lawyers, but also for non-lawyers. So the language that uh, Sa Sandra Fedman always used is always so accessible and I, I was able to uh, develop the same from her. It was also, uh, I was also inspired by my supervisor at the Judiciary Committee on Election Preparations, now Judiciary Committee on Elections, Honorable Lilian Arika, who taught me that every case that is filed in court carries the hopes and dreams of an individual, the hopes and, and dreams of a family or a particular group that wake, is, wakes up early to attend court every time their case is coming up to seek justice within the corridors of justice. And uh, some even borrow money to be able to access courts. Some walk long distances. Some have to even be carried up the ste steps because uh, for those who are physically disabled, you find that our institutions in Kenya, uh, many of them are not uh, disability friendly. So you can just imagine this financial, the physical and emotional strain that comes into play. And this is what part of the book, this, this is discussed in part of the book. Muso is my biggest mentor, my mother, who is here with me today, Martha Echayo Miandazi, who as a single parent of eight children, taught me and my siblings that boys can also cook and that girls can be lawyers, journalists, they can be textile and interior designers, policy makers and tax experts. She is the reason why I'm here today. And also her fight for justice greatly inspires me. She's here smiling a lot. And uh, so it is the lived experiences of gender discrimination, persons with disabilities, ethnic and social marginalization, poverty, sex, among others, that inspires this book launch. And as you will hear today, the book sets out how to understand the different concepts of equality within the 2010 constitution. This is in light, as the Honorable Chief Justice has said, in light of our social and historical context with the goal of finding coherence. So equality is such a short but very powerful term. It also has multiple meanings, just a small word, but it has so many multiple meanings when we consider who should be treated as an equal as our personal characteristics differ, you find persons who are 
because of the gender, sex, uh, disability, and so on, we all differ in some sort of way. And also when we consider what should be equalized, because we have, right now we have the COVID pandemic, we have uh, issues to do with access to healthcare, we have housing issues because of the many evictions that uh, have been happening in Kenya. We also have to consider issues like political power, opportunities, as well as issues to do with taxation. How can that, what, what should be equalized? So we find that there are many competing conceptions, all of which are contained in the constitution and discussed in the book. And as you will hear today, and as the Honorable Chief, Retired Chief Justice David Maraga has said, the book discusses important and key issues that include, first of all, how to expound the grounds for non-discrimination listed in Article 27.4 of the Constitution to include grounds that are not listed, for instance, refugee status and so on. Secondly, I discuss affirmative action. We've heard about the 2000 rule and also affirmative action with regards to accommodation of difference for persons with disabilities in Kenya. So for instance, I postulate, for instance, that treatment as an equal for persons with disabilities means making transportation accessible to physically disabled persons on wheelchairs, hospitals and other institutions to also be accessible. That there, there should be ramps, lifts, and even sign language interpreters in uh, institutions so as to adequately cater for people with different disabilities and ensure that they get equal access to essential services. As we've also mentioned, thirdly, I discuss the controversial topic of religion and culture versus equality. Fourth, I also discuss the important topic of the relationship between the provision of socioeconomic rights and deprivation of socioeconomic rights and how it's really heightened when we consider statuses such as uh, gender, disabilities, dis persons with disabilities, refugee status, minority ethnicity, and so on. So we will hear more of this from today's speakers. Welcome again, and thank you for tuning in. Thank you again, Chief Justice. On to you, Megan and Okubasi. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Victoria, for that uh, overview, particularly for those who have not had a chance to flip through the book like I had. And uh, listening to quite your moving inspiration and the reason behind writing the book, someone would be tempted to think that it's an ethnography, a description, a thick description of uh, your lived experiences and your encounters with the inequality must be quite awful. And anyway, having said that, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Professor Sandra Fredman who will be our next uh, speaker. And uh, she has already been introduced many times, replete times uh, throughout Victoria's uh, speech. You could hear her name uh, being mentioned. She is a professor of uh, the laws of the British Commonwealth and the USA at Oxford University and a professorial fellow at Oxford's Pembroke College, a founder and the director of the Oxford Human Rights Hub I think it's a, uh, a wonderful institution that uh, publicizes developments in human rights across uh, the globe and it has yet received the publicity that it deserves. And uh, she has published widely on human rights, uh, labor law and equality. And uh, her books include Women and the Law, Discrimination Law, Human Rights Transform and Comparative Human Rights. And uh, she was elected a uh, fellow of the British Academy in 2005 and became a QC, Queen's Council Honoris Causa in 2012. It is my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Sandy to uh, make some remarks. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Duncan, thank you to Vicky and, and to Megan, I'm, I, I want to start by saying how thrilled I am to be part of the launch of Victoria's groundbreaking book, and particularly to be sharing this opportunity with the other, with the panelists, the esteemed panelists, um, <clears throat> and to thank the honor, honorary Chief Justice for his 
wonderful uh, introductory remarks uh, about Vicky's book. So as Vicky said, um, I was the supervisor of her thesis in Oxford, and I'm so delighted to have been part of her journey from the beginning of her project when it was just a set of vague ideas to now seeing it, first of all, uh, be awarded a DPhil Doctor of Philosophy and now to be published as a book. And all my students know that as soon as they get their doctorate, the very first thing I do is to encourage them strongly to take the next step and get it published because academic work is there to be shared and used not just to sit on a shelf and get dusty. So this is just truly a wonderful moment to see the book published. And it's a great tribute to Victoria's talent, to her rigorous approach as a scholar, but also to her commitment to ensuring that ideas of equality are not just a matter of academic discussion, but are there to advance actual equality for people and societies. So it's, uh, it's, it's particularly important then that this book focuses on the concepts of equality within the Kenyan constitution. And as she says at the start of her work, um, Kenyans overwhelming support for the 2010 constitution demonstrated their desire for a constitution with equality at its core. But what's unique about uh, Victoria's approach is that she doesn't only look at the equality clause in the constitution, Article 27, but also the way in which equality is woven in to the constitution in lots of different places, including the provisions on socioeconomic rights, as we've heard, the recognition of cultural and religious equality and um, affirmative action. And what her book does is it stands out in taking a holistic view of these different roles of equality and attempting to find coherence between them. Um, in particular, she draws on conceptions of substantive equality. That is, equality isn't just about treating everybody the same, regardless of their background of disadvantage or exclusion. She sees equality as advancing those who are disadvantaged, as well as achieving dignity and recognition, um, giving people voice, but also seeing the underlying structural obstacles which um, are built into society, which perpetuate inequality. So by taking a substantive view of equality in this way, she can draw together these different parts of the constitution, the commitment to status e e equality, that is equality on grounds of gender, on grounds of religion, on grounds of disability, but also socioeconomic rights, which is distributive inequality, um, equality of which actually overlaps very much with the status inequality. So by looking at substantive equality from these different dimensions, um, she can see that um, socioeconomic disadvantage is concentrated among women, among people with disabilities, among other excluded groups. And also that to address this, we need to look at all of those dimensions, including lack of participation, lack of voice, and the structural obstacles. Um, so um, this also allows her to um, navigate potential conflicts between different um, parts of the constitution. So in affirmative action, some people might argue that affirmative action is giving extra privileges, say to women in, in representation in parliament. But by seeing it as substantive equality, it can be seen to be furthering equality and not breaching it by making sure that there is a better representation in Parliament. Um, <clears throat> the same is true for her, her, uh, her discussion of the conflict between potential conflict between religion and culture on the one hand and gender inequality. And I would very much commend you to read her chapter on this very difficult issue. So 
there's a huge need for a work which develops a coherent and mutually supportive understanding of the different conceptions of equality in the Kenyan constitution, especially now during the first couple of decades of its existence. And this is exactly what Vicky's book does. So for Kenyans who seek to understand their institution, for lawyers and advocates who litigate the constitution, for politicians who further it through their policies, and above all, for judges who interpret the constitution, this book is going to be a must. But the book isn't only for Kenyans. It's important for everyone globally who is interested in constitutional provisions on equality um, and for all of those to engage with the inequalities that actual people experience, not just the theory of equality, but how actual people experience inequality. Um, and one of the other important strengths of Vicky's book then is to take comparative perspectives seriously. And she uses them to shed light on the Kenyan constitution, especially gaps, silences, but she's also very aware of the Kenyan, the Kenyan context and the need to recognize uh, that ke the Kenyan constitution and its context are unique. So the approach of other jurisdictions can't just be transplanted whole, that would be a mistake. But on the other hand, jurisdictions all over the world are confronting the same questions. How do we resolve conflicts between um, religion and uh, gender, for example? How do we uh, understand the meaning of affirmative action? And all of these mean that comparative law is a resource to draw on, to draw on to find good reasons to choose one path rather than another, also good reasons to reject some paths rather than another. Um, so her work is also a very valuable um, example of excellent use of comparative law, how it can and how it should not be used in furthering some of these gaps and silences in the Kenyan constitution, especially now in the early years when precedents are still being developed. So one example which Vicky uses very successfully is in relation to the grounds of discrimination when um, some grounds are mentioned and others are not. Uh, some are not mentioned as, as she said herself. One complex one is sexual orientation. Um, by looking at other jurisdictions, you can understand how they've grappled with this problem, but then choose between these different ways and develop a uniquely Kenyan way of understanding it. Um, so just to conclude, anyone who's interested in the right to equality, both in Kenya and from a comparative perspective, will gain enormously from this book. But even more, as, as Victoria said herself, this is about advancing actual people's experience, achieving actual equality on the ground, and all the way through the reality of inequality and of, of, of people's particular experience of inequality informs this work and attempts to find ways forward, find not fully solutions, but ways of addressing it. So I would recommend this book warmly for everybody who's listening should read it. And I look forward to the contributions of my fellow panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Sandy. I think your comments are so interesting because one of the things we can see in the, the, at least the academic study of, of the right to equality is that it tends to cluster on certain jurisdictions and other jurisdictions do not receive um, comparative or international attention. And I think Victoria's monograph is uh, really groundbreaking that it has truly added another jurisdiction to the, the, the unofficial canon of jurisdictions that, to study in the right to equality by really taking seriously the right to equality in Kenya and not only bringing in comparative, but now other jurisdictions have one more sort of rich source to think about what does a right to equality mean for actual people who've experienced inequality. So thank you, Sandy, for those really, really um, helpful remarks about what comparative law can teach us about right to equality, both for our own jurisdiction and, and, and looking at um, our other jurisdictions. 
And now we turn to Professor Patricia Kamari Mbote, and it is a true delight to have her to join us. She'll be speaking about equality and land rights, which for those of us who study equality is so, so important as in and of itself, equality within land is any like any field of life, equality is desirable, but also really important thinking about equality in land is equality in access to economic resources, access equality in, in power. And so it's a delight to have her speaking on Victoria's book. And just to introduce her more properly, Professor Kamara Mbote is the professor of law at the School of Law at the University of Nairobi, where she's also the first female dean. So a true groundbreaker, not only in her scholarship, but in her actual academic practice. She's also, another, the groundbreaking with uh, Professor Kamara Mbote does not end. She was also the first female professor of law in Kenya. So a true, true figure within legal scholarship in Kenya. She's the founding research director of International Environmental Law Research Center, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. And so it's my great honor to introduce her. And before I do so, just one uh, logistical housekeeping thing that we forgot to mention at the beginning is that in the true spirit of equality, this uh, book launch isn't only available in English. There's also a Swahili interpretation that's available on YouTube. Uh, if you are on the internet, which you must be if you're watching this, if you go to the Oxford Human Rights Hub YouTube, uh, pardon me, Twitter account, you'll find a link for the Swahili interpretation. So it'll be available in multiple languages so that uh, the audience uh, for this really important conversation can be broader. So now with that uh, cleared up, I will now turn to Professor Kamara Mbote for her remarks. Thank you very much, Megan, for your introduction. And uh, I'd just like also to join everybody in uh, congratulating Vicky for bringing the issue of equality under this prism, which enables us to look at it from different vantage points. I love book launches, I must confess, but uh, the launch of a book on equality is a great occasion for me. And the focus on Kenya, I must say, is the icing on the cake. And this is because um, when you look at uh, this whole concept of equality, uh, it, as uh, Vicky aptly says, it's a contested uh, concept. People praise it, others disparage it. And I think it's Dworkin who said that those praising it do not know why they're doing it and neither do those who disparage it. And uh, in my view, the book is very timely because it comes at a time when the disquiet with laws promise of equality in Kenya is very loud. Uh, when uh, the 2010 constitution was promulgated, we expected to say goodbye to inequality, but were we wrong? And um, we have come to learn that equality and its uh, corollary inequality are complex issues of social justice. It's not just one principle. And I think that is uh, brought out very clearly in the different chapters of Vicky's uh, book. Uh, we've uh, come to see that no single notion of equality suffices. And I think, again, that is uh, very um, amply uh, demonstrated in Vicky's book. And the bringing out of other jurisdictions makes us see this even more clearly. So um, Vicky's canvassing of substantive equality or equity is also great because it underscores the point that context matters. And I think when you talk about land rights, you can't talk about land without contextualization. Uh, context colors the rights of subjects and the legal discourses that uh, uh, held about them. Uh, and basically, when you look at uh, the 2010 Constitution's vision, uh, and what we are at now, 10 years on, we see that the vision is largely unattained. And maybe it's because we've not given context as much attention as we ought to have given it. Reading Vicky's book made me imagine myself writing a doctoral thesis. And I set out to define my problem. And I defined it this way that despite the very clear provisions on equality and non-discrimination in the 2010 constitution, 
Nevertheless, inequality is still the norm in many spheres, including land, because we have not laid out an equality framework that ranks and intersects existing inequalities to determine the domino inequality or inequalities that if addressed would address other inequalities. I would go on to say that we must approach rights circumspectly. And again, I come to these uh, from uh, the experience that I've had with rights. I mean, uh, they justify slavery, colonization, subjugation, and exclusion of indigenous populations. And this is the story of land, whether you're talking about land of the Native Americans or land of Native Kenyans. Uh, rights are ridden with hierarchies and asymmetries, uh, which uh, bring out contradictions, disputations, rivalries and instabilities. And uh, most importantly, rights are also laced with uh, power relation, uh, relations. So within uh, that context, then uh, one cannot say that uh, equality is an easy, uh, an easy norm to attain. I would be remiss uh, speaking about equality in Kenya if I didn't uh, talk about the feminist critique of rights, considering our failure to realize the not more than two thirds gender rule 10 years after the constitution clearly provided for it. And uh, I would also again in my, in my critique of rights be remiss as an environmental law scholar if I didn't go to ecocentric critiques of rights, uh, which would ask whether we should just be looking at anthropocentric approaches to natural resources, or we should approach natural resources in and of themselves because they have rights. Uh, so in, in essence then, uh, when it comes to land rights, we must look at land rights within um, the chiasmus of equality. One, Property rights to land include the owner, but they exclude the non-owner. And I think that uh, paradox is what uh, uh, colors the whole discussion of uh, equality. If you look at rights to land in Kenya, you must look at the colonial context, which again is a context of inequality, the introduction of dual rights, modern uh, native, formal, non-formal, and uh, also the uh, expectation that native rights were really not quite rights, but uh, they would one day grow up to become formal and modern. And of course, the historical injustices uh, that uh, attended the acquisition of land rights uh, through colonization, the gross disparities in land holdings and the iniquities around that. And I think uh, finally, going back to the inclusion, exclusion of property rights, that title to unjustly acquired land rights sealed the fate of land, uh, land rights of natives, permanently removing land from uh, native ownership and use. And the fact that the independent constitution, which had a bill of rights and protected land rights, favored uh, modern uh, formal settlers' rights to land and discounted Africans' uh, claims to land. So the post-independence handling of land rights continued these biases, disenfranchising very many people and creating perverse incentives to get individual rights even when those were inappropriate. But we have informal customary land law being so resilient that uh, in coming up with the 2010 constitution, uh, th these were recognized. But being recognized so many years after, I think it's called the Gendo, who calls it centuries of, uh, of uh, subversion. Uh, they, even the, the provision in the constitution that all land rights are equal, cannot bring up communal land rights to the very elevated uh, space that um, individual land rights uh, enjoy. So the, the constitution
constitution of Kenya then uh, by providing work for communal land rights brings them to a point of equality with uh, individual land rights. But uh, the context within which these have existed for many years is still means that uh, those rights are held as not as, um, as they are not held as highly as the private rights. And I was just reading a paper written by Dr. Odote and others talking about uh, how our community land rights law over promises but under delivers. And I think in the over promising under delivery is because of assuming just saying that the land rights systems are, or the tenures are equal, it would happen naturally. So, so we have uh, that layer of land rights that are not equal, but we are not even getting to the inequities or inequalities of those who hold the land rights. So if the land rights are, equal, are unequal, even the holders of the rights are unequal. So those who have private land rights have a more hallowed space than those who have community land rights. And as if that wasn't enough, we then go to the resources on the land. People who have resources on communal land have their rights very being very tenuous compared to those who have resources on uh, individually owned land. And uh, so you have people whose rights to water, whose rights to forests are affected just because the kind of land rights holding they have is not held in as high esteem as others. And uh, I would not like to stop at such a pessimistic space. I think what we need to do, and, and this uh, Vicky's work can help us do, is to come up with a clear equality framework, which would benefit uh, uh, land, right, land and resource rights holders and all Kenyans. And uh, basically, I'm calling for an urgent uh, coming up with an overarching equality legal framework, capturing the competing and interrelated conceptions of equality and equity in Kenya. And then after that, you would go on to look at what does that imply for land and resources. The framework, in my view, must take on board the legal pluralist Kenyan law and address the contending equality and equity norms in that framework. It must go beyond uh, formal equality. It must pursue equity, unpack, rank, intersect inequalities, because it is not enough to place inequality side by side. You must look at how they intersect with each other. And I think uh, because our constitution also provides for uh, affirmative action and uh, many countries have experiences with this, we must work on benchmarks uh, for these affirmative action measures and uh, look at what is it that uh, will signal when we stop applying the measures. Uh, a good equality framework in my view should be dynamic. It should respond to and recognize emerging threat multipliers for those who are not uh, who, who are not being treated um, with uh, equity. So it must look at threat multipliers for different subjects of law. For instance, when uh, natural disasters come or pandemics such as COVID-19, a good equality framework should be able to respond to this and uh, justice sector actors need to understand such a framework uh, very clearly if equality, equity is to take root and uh, become a way of being. And of course the judiciary being the vanguard of equality and non-discrimination should be at the forefront of pushing the rights of those who are marginalized, whether it's uh, uh, land or other rights that people hold. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambote. I'm sure that uh, everyone that has been listening to you, including myself, has received very incisive views on the concept of equality. And perhaps 
provided uh, justification for an urgent need for Victoria to sit down and come up with uh, a second edition as such, but a new volume, a second monograph on equality and, uh, and, and land rights. And uh, we, we must admit also listening to uh, Professor Mbote that uh, Victoria has set down, I think, uh, the framework that can allow uh, these discourses to then spiral to various you know, spheres of, of, of life and uh, interactions. And uh, we have had Professor Kameri Mbote speaking to us about land rights. I, I guess a similar discourse can be made about you know, another uh, aspect, say education in a much more pronounced way and not just uh, socioeconomic rights. And uh, uh, I think that uh, it's quite uh, humbling to listen to those quite um, incisive views. I will uh, take this opportunity to introduce our next speaker, who is uh, Professor uh, John Osogo Ambani. Professor uh, John Osogo Ambani is uh, a newly appointed dean at Kabarak University School of Law in Kenya. He holds a Doctor of Laws degree from the University of Pretoria and has taught and published quite widely in the areas of constitutionalism that I know, uh, governance, and, and the latest book being Africa and the Decolonization of State Religion Policies that has been published uh, by Brill. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Ambani to give his comments and remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Okubasu uh, and Campbell. I'm very happy to, uh, to be on this platform. In fact, very excited to be here. Um, allow me to join uh, all the other panelists in congratulating Dr. Miyandazi. Um, she's done a great thing. Uh, she deserves more than we can offer uh, for many reasons that can be said. But speaking as a a young Kenyan that went to Kenya University at that point, uh, there were no books in this part of the world. Um, apart from uh, a, a major work by Professor Yash Palgai, who we had never seen, uh, major works by J.B. Juang, Professor, and uh, Professor Koto Gendo, uh, there were rarely any works by uh, you know, native Kenyans and, and many times we thought that writing books was a taboo among the Africans. Um, uh, of course, until uh, professors like uh, Kameri Mbote also began to write um, at their time. I remember her books uh, very vividly, for example, Wildlife Conservation Management in Kenya. And, and now you can see that we are inspired because um, a person as young as Miandazi can now write books and very high quality books. I think this is not just for me, it is inspiring for all of us uh, in the academy in Kenya to know that it is actually possible to write. I'm quite excited about this. Um, allow me to say um, that I'm excited about many things as well. Professor Amambani, you're now on mute. Would you be able to unmute yourself? I think you have accidentally hit the mute button. Perfect. Was I unmuted all, all along? No, no, just the last maybe 15 seconds. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I was saying that her work is great um, and also inspiring. And not just for me, I believe for most of the academics in Kenya, especially those 40 and below, who, who initially thought that Africans were, were stopped from writing serious works. Uh, now there's an example uh, that we can all emulate. It is achievable and uh, Miandazi has led the way. I'm quite excited about that uh, kind of achievement. Congratulations yet again, Miandazi. And on that, allow me to proceed to what I thought about um, your writing in the chapter of culture and religion, that was chapter six. Um, it's rare that I agree with the writer, especially who is schooled in uh, a Western university, but this time I do. 
<laughs> yeah, and, and, and I will tell you why. The first one was already mentioned uh, by our very able moderator. The translation to Swahili, we can talk about that later, but that is a major achievement right there in Oxford, um, because even our constitution has not been successfully translated into Swahili. That, that is a serious step forward in the language of decolonization. Um, the other thing that I saw as a major strength is that you actually adopt or at least engage with the concept of transformative constitutionalism. Um, it's very easy to get lost in other frameworks, um, especially in the Western world. You didn't disappear. You remained relevant to our context. And that's, again, um, very, very good. Um, I also note, as a second point, that you realized that equality was not just a mere legal concept to be confined to the four walls of law. Um, I see that you engaged equality beyond law. Um, you engaged equality in the realms of culture, for example, the realms of religion. Um, and, and that says a lot about the depth of your work. Um, you did a lot of work. Um, and just to point out that you went on to, to refer to very competent African writers, which again uh, would be very rare for dissertations done where you did it. Um, and I'm sure you, it shows that uh, um, you were quite awake, you are quite relevant to your context, even as you did it far away from your home. Um, I was happy to see Jomo Kenyatta's facing Mount Kenya in a law thesis. Uh, that was quite inspiring as well. I was happy to see uh, Professor Ali Mazrui being cited in this work, and I'll come back to that. Um, he's not just a leading uh, African scholar, but he's outside law in political science, that you find his works relevant and use them you know, extensively in the chapter I'm referring to, shows also your acumen as a scholar and research, uh, something that I, should, I, I thought I should flag out. Um, the other thing I noted uh, was that you didn't rush to westernization or globalization for solutions. Um, it could have been very easy for you, by the way, uh, to rush to CEDO, for example, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Uh, it would have been very easy for you uh, to rush to uh, Western conceptualizations, you know, uh, to define the African problem or the Kenyan problem. You resisted that temptation. Um, I see, and I was quite happy that you instead went for balancing of rights um, and balanced in my view quite objectively. Um, you didn't seem to be seduced by westernization. Uh, you appeared to also have a space for the context in which your book uh, was being written. And I think that for me is something I thought I should flag out. Allow me to come back now to why I said uh, I was excited to see Professor Ali Masrui. If you remember the citation that uh, Dr. Okubasu gave me earlier, um, he mentioned that my latest book is on decolonization in Africa. Um, I have since uh, adopted that theme for my scholarship. I uh, look at uh, various aspects of public law in Africa through the lens of decolonization. Um, and one scholar that I found very useful in these lenses is uh, Professor Ali Mazrui, uh, particularly his idea of the triple heritage. Um, the triple heritage is important for me because it helped me understand many things about me, including my own name. I had rejected John as my name until I adopted Mazrui's triple heritage framework. But much more seriously, there were questions growing up as a, a young boy in the village, and you know, I began interacting with, and which questions were tough, and I didn't know the answer again until I read Mazrui thoroughly, especially the Triple Heritage, and watched the documentary of the Africans at Triple Heritage. Uh, some of the questions that an African would ask themselves, uh, even some of our listeners here, especially the younger ones, uh, for example, uh, are, is sex before marriage sinful? Is it bad? Is female circumcision evil? Is polygamy backward? And I could go on and on um, 
without stopping if we had time. But the important thing for me is to ask myself or ourselves, when did these questions emerge? What made these questions necessary in the first place? And my answer is quite simple, the triple heritage, that the African has been engaging with other civilizations. Um, initially, of course, the Arabs and Islam. Um, we had the Portuguese coming with the Christianization and then eventually the colonial epoch, especially the British for our context, Kenya, and their Christianization or their missionary work. Those three civilizations then began to compete uh, for the African attention. In fact, Mazrui calls it a cultural bazaar where the civilization, the civilizations were competing, you know, you know, to catch the high, you know, to catch the attention of the African. And sadly and unfortunately, many times the Western limb of the civilizations almost won, always won the battle. Uh, of course, because uh, it was prompted by the colonial epoch as well. So you find that the African culture kept losing to Westernization. The Arabic cultures or Islam, Islam kept losing to Westernization. And many times it was easy to rush to Westernization for a solution. Um, in this chapter, there's a case, for example, of uh, a court of appeal deciding that woman to woman marriages that are practiced among some of our communities are unconstitutional. Uh, you know, th those, those, those marriages, for example, exist among the Kisi people of Kenya, the Kikuyu, you know, the Kalenjin, and they're quite prevalent, um, you know, practices, quite accepted by our people. But the Court of Appeal, of course, easily rushed the Western side and looked at them as unconstitutional. Just recently, uh, FGM has been declared a no-no even for a woman of mature age. For those who are keen on following developments in Kenya, uh, Dr. Tatu case, um, the High Court ruled that a woman, even of age, could not decide uh, whether to take part in FGM or not. And, and that then shows you uh, the cultural mix at play in the African uh, context, and that the Africans therefore were losing, even before their own courts, before their own judges. And the reason being, of course, that even those judges, though black now, had been civilized, uh, through, had been, you know, had ad adopted the Western limb of the, the Western civilization through the schooling, uh, through the colonial epoch, and now are quick to sideline our own values and cultures. What Miandazi did here, and which is why I'm here to applaud her, was to reject those temptations to just rush to one solution, to just rush one way, and give the Africans a chance but at the same time, balancing and giving women rights a chance. So for example, she mentions the concept of the right of exit as I finish, which I, I found quite exciting also um, in, in, in scholarship. Um, for those who are familiar with Kenyan, uh, you know, Kenyan jurisprudence, there was a case of SM Otieno in which the question arose, can an African man that chooses another civilization uh, opt out, or are you stuck there until death? And there were quite interesting uh, submissions of that case, including that you could only exit, for example, Luo culture uh, through already established criteria in that culture, that you just can't walk out, uh, you, are, you, are, you are bound there. But Miandazi here gives us a chance to explore uh, a balanced position whereby culture can continue, but that some people might be allowed to opt out. That for me shows that she's aware of the triple heritage at play and I've always added globalization, which is now also influencing the Africans in that direction. So with those few remarks, um, I think I can say that I am happy that there's another book on this topic. And, I, and, and just to mention that the Academy in Kenya is on defense, has been put to defense, including recently during the Judicial Service Commission interviews for, for the appointment of the next Chief Justice. And the accusation against us, the Academy, is that we are not writing and that we are not engaging with emerging disciplines and even worse, the 2010 Constitution, which you should have assessed by now. Thank you, Miandazi, 
for defending us as an entire academy in Kenya and for giving us something to show that we have actually done our own analysis of the Trenton Constitution and made some prescriptions that could be useful going forward. I think those would be my first remarks and I'll be happy, of course, to come back in case there is need. Thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. Campbell, Okubasu, and Miandazi. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ambani, for your provocative, I can say, uh, comments and uh, sentiments about uh, the book and about uh, what the book means, particularly in a setup where writing is not yet a booming business. Uh, of course, I was wondering as you were speaking, why you decided to publish your book on decolonization of state religion policies uh, at Leiden in, uh, through, by April. Uh, I thought that you could just do it here in Uganda or around here in Somalia. Uh, maybe you are truly uh, engaged in... I can give you the answer right away. <laughs> <laughs> if you gave me latitude. Yes, please. Yeah. I, I, I said earlier that I had difficulties accepting even my name. If you see my earlier scholarships, they were under the name Osogo or Ambani. I thought that John was foreign and had rejected it. But when I internalized the triple heritage, um, which Professor Mazrui Ebley writes, then I realized that an African now can only be defined along those three civilizations. And my scholarship now adds globalization. So. them, only that I reject uh, situations where westernization, uh, you know, tries to unreasonably triumph over the other civilizations. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, inter timely intervention, I must say. Uh, of course, uh, it reminds us of uh, the book that was written by Temple La Philosophie de Bantu, the Bantu philosophy which was claimed to be the first book uh, trying to espouse African ontology and the idea that Africans have a philosophy of their own. And subsequently, writers like Masolo came on board and said, look, that book was not an African philosophy because the book had not been written by an African, uh, that a book in African philosophy can only be one which was authored by an African and not by uh, a French uh, bishop. Uh, who had uh, started to do some ethnographic work in, in, in Congo. Uh, and uh, going by that, I think uh, we should applaud Vicky, as you rightly put it. She introduces uh, this part of uh, the world, I think uh, Kenya in particular, to, um, she exposes uh, the circumstances and the context of Kenya to a discourse that is ongoing uh, and so we can proudly indeed uh, Victoria is one of those uh, people that uh, whose scholarship provides really not just an inspiration but a pedestal for others to build on and uh, bring I think much more exposure of uh, conceptions local indigenous conceptions about the, uh, aspects that are already uh, in mainstream scholarship. Uh, I could have said uh, about your about your comments, but maybe we will go into the other session when a question or two may be asked. But for now, I'll give uh, my co-moderator uh, Megan an opportunity to introduce Professor Mari. Thank you, and we're now on to the one of the last substantive panels for this um, really rich book launch, and that's with. Professor Christina Murray. She's going to be speaking about affirmative action and the right to equality, which, as most of us listening will know, is one of the most contentious areas in the right to equality. And it's very rare to not see in the news some debate about if affirmative action is good for equality, if affirmative action is good for the economy, if affirmative action is good for the state, if affirmative action is good for the beneficiaries. And the debates about affirmative action span so many different jurisdictions. And it's Vicky's work is so groundbreaking and really taking very seriously, what does affirmative action mean within Kenya and grounding within the Kenyan context? And so we'll have Christina Murray discussing this really, really challenging facet of the right to equality. 
and to introduce her properly, uh, Professor Murray is an Emeritus Professor of Human Rights and Constitutional Law at the University of Cape Town and is a Senior Advisor of the UN Mediation Support Standby Team. And she focuses on constitutional making and constitutional design. And so with that, I'll turn the floor over to her. Hi, thank you very much. And it really is an honor to be here. It's, it's great to be among so many, I think, um, Kenyans again, to be part of a lively and provocative conversation, but especially Victoria, it's fantastic to be celebrating this with you. I'm really honored. Um, Victoria and I, in fact, sort of have had encounters about this book in the past, um, and I always found them really a pleasure and fun. But I should say, perhaps, Victoria, you didn't find them as much fun as I did, because mostly they were under exam conditions. Um, but anyhow, that was how I got a little bit of an entree to the progress and, and the book. Um, but, but that pleasure of being engaged with, with it in small ways earlier on is now really kept by seeing it released. Um, so I've got to thank you yet again for inviting me to participate and for the couple of days I've just had reading it. Um, so I've been immersed in the book, challenged by new ideas and possibilities in relation to a constitution that I thought I knew quite well. So it's been fun. Um, now often I think a book all I really expect of a book is to bring me up to speed in a subject. Um, this one has done so much more. It's prompted me to think, as I've just said, it's reignited my interest in Kenyan law. Um, as I think many of you know also, and Professor Ambani has already alluded to this, Kenya has a very, very rich literature in political science and sociology and history and extraordinary literature, perhaps the richest um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, but its legal literature has really lagged behind. It's only quite recently, as far as I can see, that it's got a bit of energy. And this book, in my sense is, this book is a really big step ahead on that road to building a legal literature in Kenya that measures up to the extraordinary politics and sociology literature you already have. So just generally, this is wonderful. Um, and as um, Megan said, I was asked to talk a bit about affirmative action and she's just listed some of the extremely complicated and important issues that affirmative action raises. However, I'm sort of a little bit embarrassed to say that I've done very little thinking about affirmative action over the last decade or so. So what I wanted to do now was just pick up some of the things that struck me in the book about affirmative action and leave the rest, I hope, to dis the discussion. Um, I do think that affirmative action, as Megan has already alluded to, is one of the most elusive elements of a concept that, as Victoria says at the beginning of the book, that is elusive. That is, equality is a very difficult um, concept to cabin as an American writer once said, um, and the affirmative action element of um, equality sort of is especially so. Anyhow, so I was just going to raise a couple of points. Of course, and I know this has already, already been mentioned, sort of one of the most prominent things we see at the moment about affirmative action um, in Kenya is the ongoing saga of the gender quota in parliament. Um, and that problem, as many of you will know, is created by the fact that the constitution at one and the same time requires, so this is my gloss, but requires a third of the members of parliament to be women and sets up an electoral system that makes that practically impossible. So there is, in my view, um, a simple contradiction. And I think that that is the fault of the constitution makers. Um, we can discuss how and why that came about later, but it to me is a problem inherent in the constitution and that's why Kenyans, as I understand it, have been trying to, to fix it for the last 10 years. The whole thing makes me think of um, a 19th century Argentinian constitutionalist who said that a constitution is intended or the role of a constitution is to solve the main political dramas of the time and provide a platform or whatever in which 
future political dramas can be resolved. In this context, I sometimes think that the Constitution has created a political drama <laughs> rather than resolving it. And what is really disappointing about this, to me at least, and I think to many Kenyans, is it means that the Constitution failed to implement one of the most important um, gains that women had made in Kenya over the previous 25 years. And that gain, the commitment to a gender quota, um, was, as you all know better than I, was a result of an extraordinary perseverance of hundreds, perhaps thousands of people. Um, so it's a sort of terrible failing, I think, that the constitution was really born with this inherent flaw, set back the women's agenda, and of course led, as the Chief Justice mentioned earlier, to a breach of an order by the Chief Justice, a serious um, breach in the rule of law. Um, so having said all of that, <laughs> does anything good come of this? Um, I mean, I don't think anything good comes of um, this kind of contradiction in a constitution. Um, I'm really disappointed to see that the current um, controversial um, proposals to amend the constitution, the proposals I think you call the BP, BBI, initiative, the Building Bridges Initiative, sort of has an attempt, as far as I can see, to resolve this problem of the representation of women in parliament. But it does so while at the same, in the proposal, at the same time removing the special representation for people with disabilities and youth. So you see, sort of see a real irony there as you try to solve one equality problem by um, taking away a different, and I think rather important affirmative action element in the constitution. Anyhow, so that's sort of me being despondent about this, but on the other side, is there anything good in all of this? And one little thing strikes me, and that is that at least the constitution does affirm the um, validity of quotas. Um, and that may be positive, because at the moment there's a, in, I'm a South African, and at the moment there's quite a, a sort of increasingly heightened controversy about whether our affirmative action provision, the South African affirmative action provision, which is fairly similar to the Kenyan one, um, permits quotas at all, or whether it's only targets that are allowed under the South African constitution. Um, there's very involved legal argumentation on all of this in South Africa, and it deals with fairness and dignity, and some judges are arguing that um, quotas themselves are inherently arbitrary. Now, another student of Sandy's, um, Nomfunda Ramalakana, um, has just, who I hope Victoria is following in your footsteps, um, and she has just published um, a very incisive criticism of the conceptual confusion um, in this, in what are now quite a large number of judgments in South Africa, struggling with this issue of quotas and targets. So just on that point, I really do hope at least the fact that there are this acknowledgement of quotas in the constitution will allow Kenya to sidestep this whole sort of rather turgid and I suspect very expensive um, debate um, in South African law at the moment. So perhaps something good can well, come well. despite the error. That's the one point, the inevitable this problem with the um, quotas in Parliament. The second sort of thing that struck me as I read the chapter and that I found really illuminating is your discussion, Victoria, of um, the set of articles that deal with specially identified people. The section on children, which is quite familiar, um, people living with disabilities, youth, um, older people and minority and marginalized groups. That's articles 52 to 57. Now I'd always sort of worried about kind of singling out some groups for special treatment. I particularly worried that the doing something like that might be seen almost as a closed list, that it would end up restricting the rights those people have because here they are enumerated rather than adding them on. Now the 2010 constitution resolves that problem um, by adopting a proposal that Yash Gai actually made in a draft constitution he produced in 2006 after the CKRC was over. Um, and in that draft, he had 
set those special provisions aside in a part uh, of the Bill of Rights, clearly saying that these supplement um, the ordinary rights. Um, now, what I like about what your discussion, Victoria, does to, to those issues um, is it links those rights clearly to equality and to the very substantive notion of equality in the Constitution. Um, and I think the Constitution is unambiguously committed to substantive equality. I don't see any competition there, but anyhow, but I really like that link. But I also, and Sandy's already mentioned this, like the sort of inclusive way you deal with those rights and link them to socioeconomic rights. So it really is, as Sandy said right at the outset, um, a helpful description of or analysis of how rights can be um, substantively interpreted and into the equality right, especially interlocks with other things. So that's sort of a second point. Just the third and last point I wanted to talk about is this really quite, for me, quite tricky element um, in the equality provision that requires special measures to be based on a genuine need. Um, and this, here, I think you've made me think. Is that my noise or someone else's? I think just, just keep going. It's OK. okay. Um, I think, as, as many of you will know, Chapter 20, um, Article 27 of the Constitution says that measures take what, what, Article 27 is that any measures taken to address disadvantage should be based on genuine need. Now, I've sort of really been troubled by that provision from the outset. Um, we kind of know that sometimes um, when groups are identified for special treatment, for affirmative action, it's a sort of small elite at the top of the group, the Indians refer to it as a creamy layer, who are persistently privileged by that affirmative action and um, other people in that group remain disadvantaged, don't escape their disadvantage and their subordination. But you know, the requirement of having to identify a genu genuine need is, is really vague and it seems to me to interfere badly with the way in which um, the limitation clause should work. It sort of takes over a bit of the job of the limitation clause perhaps, um, and it may interfere with the um, requirement of proportionality. I mean, you've suggested, Victoria, that perhaps genuine need should be interpreted quite strictly, that it should, should be leading to quite a strict um, kind of necessity test. I've sort of, and I've only been thinking about this for about 24 hours, but I've started worrying about that. You quote McCrudden, who says, you know, it means that affirmative action can happen only when everything else has been tried, a real last resort. Um, can that be right? Um, why do we want to put such a extra hurdle in the way of achieving substantive equality? And that seems a sort of even more important question when you see, as you demonstrate so well, how substantive the whole constitution is infused with a commitment to substantive equality as part of the transformative agenda. So I suppose I found myself um, sort of over the last day or two thinking, ah, no, you know, I wish that provision wasn't there. I don't think it's helpful. I think limitations clauses can do the job on their own very well. Um, and now that it is there, is there some way of interpreting it so that it is less obstructive to the real struggle that women particularly, but all groups, because these measures are not only for women, of course, um, so that the struggle for, for substantive equality is not made more difficult. So that's a bit of a challenge. Thank you very much. Um, it's been great being part of this conversation. Thank you, Professor uh, Mare, and uh, it's really our pleasure to listen to you, knowing that either you are part of the solution or part of the problems that uh, uh, Victoria was dealing with as she tried to um, understand the uh, different conceptions of equality that uh, flow from 
this text that you must have participated you participated in actually in writing now um I'll, I'll i'll not make my comments uh on on your uh remarks because uh, i think i'll leave that to uh the q and a session uh, and we are moving to the next session which is a q and a session where i think we'll be inviting questions from uh, participants uh feel free to uh, send us uh, your message through the direct uh, chat and then we will uh to either to victoria or to any of the panelists that are here with us and then we will uh, of course ask them uh, the questions now uh to start of us us i think i will i will i will start with uh professor mare who has just been the the last speaker if you had been asked to redraft the equality provisions in view of what victoria has said about the equality provisions will you uh write a, a, a different uh you know will you adopt a different form or structure or substance or would you actually leave it just the way it was it is oh so now i get put in the in the sort of <laughs> person doing the viva seat um hmm, you know i've never really thought of that i think i would i've just said i would delete the um 27.7 which adds i just think extra difficulty um jumping outside that actually article 27 though i think one of the things i regret most about the kenyan constitution and i know my colleagues i think all of my colleagues on the committee of experts do too is the provision that relates to um um is it what islamic law and so on um which allows um, I'm trying to remember the exact language. I'm sure other people there will remember it better, which sort of gives us a bit of a pass card to um, some practices um, that might infringe rights. And obviously that has goes directly to gender rights. So rather than having them just struggle through as one does when, and um, um, Professor Mbani has already raised some of these questions. I mean, you want to be able to have a discussion about those issues, not have the door closed to some extent by the constitution. So I worry about that. And of course, the other thing one worries about in the constitution is that weird provision, which says that um, the army and so on, the security services don't have some rights, not exactly equality, but insofar as they cover socioeconomic rights, and I think that provision does, what's it doing there? So not really answering your question but a little few comments great well, i'll maybe victoria did you want to respond to that first question at all to flip the uh, examiner chair back to back to victoria away from christina yes so with regards to the question about what would be done differently of course uh, in terms of that provision and uh um, the limitations clause, which gives an exception for uh, an equality except, exemption for uh, Islamic law. It's uh, with regards to equality not applying in certain situations. It's a bit tricky because uh, it's, it, it uses like a balancing test. It requires a balancing test as to where, whether it's necessary. And so, for instance, uh, that we already have that in the limitations clause about limiting some some of the rights in the Bill of Rights um, when it is necessary or where applying the proportionality test provided for in Article 24. So I think and I agree with with uh, Christina that uh, it wasn't necessary to include that. Yes. Great. Uh, so now we can move to uh, question two, which is asking: Should the gaps in the Constitution be addressed through courts? So should socio, uh, pardon me, socio, sexual orientation discrimination be addressed through a legal interpretation or is it better to leave that to the uh, political realm, political advocacy, potential amendment to the constitution or is it more appropriate for courts to take step up and, and fill that gap? So perhaps first we could turn to Professor uh, Kamira Mbote to get her thoughts on the role of courts in addressing constitutional gaps. 
I think uh, courts um, play a very great role in filling the gaps and uh, they are expected to fill in uh, gaps where the, those occur. And I think already there are quite a number of cases that have come before the courts that uh, are helping um, in the interpretation of some of the provisions of the constitutions of the constitution that may be a bit not clear. Uh, I, I think specifically with respect to uh, women's rights, uh, there have been very many cases brought before courts. I'm not sure that they've helped move us uh, far along, but uh, I think courts are still critical because you, you're not going to have uh, provisions that are crystal clear. So we would expect that uh, for a transformative constitution that you have transformative uh, courts that uh, sort of move the interpretation along. Perhaps that follow up question to, to that. And um, this is true still to Professor uh, Kameri Bocha and Victoria could be free to intervene. Uh, you seem to have very low faith in uh, law. Uh, you, you don't seem to be convinced that uh, there are aspects of human interaction that can be addressed by uh, legal formulations such that even if we uh, sent a document to heaven and uh, it came back with our prescriptions and we're told now implement this, uh, it would seem listening to you that uh, inequality in Kenya is partially you know, within the reach of law, but uh, substantively it's out of the reach of law. And maybe that we should look up to something else that should help us to address. Because you say, look, 2010, you said this, in 2010, a new constitution, fairly excellent provisions, 10 years down the line, inequality is pervasive. You're making a justification for another book that provides us with a fresh a way to look at, at, at inequality in Kenya. Uh, I don't know, what would be your general reaction to, to that? Um, let me say that uh, I ascribe to the uh, critical uh, law I mean, critical legal studies school of thought. And in essence, uh, of course, I'm a lawyer, so, and I believe in the rule of law. But um, I think uh, coming from the experiences that we've had, I mean, I remember for many years before the 2010 constitution, how we wrote about what we wanted change in the constitution. And then 2010 comes and we think it's like being a child in a candy store. Everything you wanted is right there. And then lo and behold, the first uh, Supreme Court advisory on uh, whether the rule on uh, two thirds gender rule was to be realized immediately or it was going to be progressive. And of course, for me, that was uh, as clear as it could be. So to even hear uh, the court explaining why it should be progressive and even giving a date when that was to come in. Because my view is that had the court said it must be met, ways would have been found to find it. So in essence, law is, um, is, uh, is, it, it is a powerful tool, but uh, it can be extremely blunt when you have other countervailing forces. And in this, uh, in our country, I think we have perfected those countervailing forces. So you have things, extra legal uh, moves that actually displace law. And uh, people even justify those, I will not mention any here uh, just now, uh, but I have very clear views on what I am talking about, extra legal measures even lead to amendments of constitutions or proposed amendments of constitutions. Or you have uh, so much illegality that people begin to justify it as legality. 
So, so for me, I think we need to begin to challenge people to move beyond legality and uh, legality to a place where you're saying, do the right thing. If the law says this and it said that because people decided that was the right thing, why are we going around trying to say that it is uh, progressive, not immediate? Victoria, could we also get your thoughts on this really challenging question about constitutional change and, and which institution should be part of constitutional change? Yes, so uh, again, um, Professor Christina Murray has to leave. So thank you again for joining in. Um, you had another meeting, so thank you for setting aside time. So on to the question about constitutional change and uh, with regards to um, both Okubasu's question and the one that you've uh, mentioned from, the, from one of the participants, um, I'd like to add that with regards to the, to the book, it mentions about the fact that it's not, courts alone cannot, uh, do not have the duty for constitutional imp implementation through interpretation. Uh, the legislature has a role. And I also talk about uh, the need for mainstreaming, the need for discussing um, and sensitizing people about their rights as well so that they can be uh, uh, engaging with these conversations and be, um, not just engaging, but have the knowledge uh, as well to be able to properly participate. And uh, we see that an empowered people is uh, actually a call to action. When you empower people, you call them to action. And then also we, we can see that, uh, that it's not about just uh, courts, but also policies and uh, policies being put in institutions uh, within within government, uh, within even private institutions. And also legislation, we see that in Kenya, we don't have an equality legislation statute, for instance. We don't, uh, for instance, we've been hearing a lot of debates, but uh, the concern is so, it's so well drafted, but still we don't see uh, lots of persons with disabilities getting transportation that accommodate their various um, disabilities and so on. And so this is a discussion that needs goodwill from, um, from government officials or legislators rather. And it also needs civil society to come together to speak with one voice. You hear uh, civil society groups championing for uh, equality with regards to women's rights. Uh, some, they're, they're discussing this in their different silos, but if civil society can come together and discuss it together, they can be able to challenge, for instance, the shrinking civic space for civil society that we have been witnessing through uh, suppression of the voice of civil uh, of uh, activists and civil society members, if they speak with one voice and as a block, then their voices would be louder. And if we empower people with information, they can also join in. Okay. Thank you. I think Duncan has the next question lined up for you. Yes, um, I'm just trying to take on, I think, on a question that, uh, an issue that has been mentioned in passing by uh, Professor Kameri Mbote, and I'll direct this perhaps to Professor Sandy and uh, Vicky, uh, and it's on the issue of uh, progressive realization. Uh, having interacted with this work I think, more, very robustly, I guess, uh, I do you think maybe that uh, Kenya's um, gender discourse would be quite different if the courts had not imported this idea of uh, progressive realization into uh, the gender uh, discourse generally in, in the Kenyan context. Um, should I go first and then take you after? Or? Yes, thanks for that. That is a very difficult question. So the concept of progressive realization was initially meant for the kind of socioeconomic rights which depend on states having resources. So there was um, at least a gesture to the fact that this was not something that could be achieved immediately, but should be achieved progressively. Uh, to the maximum available resources, such as the right to housing, the right to um, the, the right to health, uh, which the was a realization you can't just get put put it on the plate and have it straight away. On the other hand, even in the context of socioeconomic rights, progressive realization has 
allowed quite a lot of prevarication. It's allowed states to say, we can't do it now, we will do it later. Um, and the, this uh, in turn led to more emphasis on those aspects which should be immediately realized. And the right not to be discriminated against has always been seen as an immediate right. It has not been seen as a progressive right. So I think, and I agree with, you, with Christina Murray and with, with others, uh, uh, with uh, Professor Kamerian Bote, who has said that to import a notion of progressive realization into this particular aspect is a, a regressive step. It's not a, a maximum available resources issue. It's an issue which can be realized immediately with the right will. Um, it, it just needs the, the kind of political will to put things into place. It's not about having to wait for any extra resources to become available. Um, so I think progressive realization needs to be confined narrowly. It should not be expanded in those kind of rights where it's not already there. For example, in the South African constitution, the right to education is the one socioeconomic right, which is an immediate right. And that has been very important in making sure that um, rights to education are realized in ways that other things like water can be kind of continually delayed. So yes, I, I would agree with the question and agree with Professor Mboti that to introduce progressive realization into this area is uh, unfortunate, um, creates delays which don't need to be there. And there really is no reason to delay. The, the background pretext might be, well, do we have enough women candidates? Do we have enough who merit it? This is all just repeating the same gendered stereotypes and the same structural obstacles, which the provision was aimed at overcoming. Yes, um, so adding from what uh, Sandy has said, I'd just like to add that, for instance, with regards to progressive realization, uh, and uh, it, with that discussion in my book, I talk about the way Article 25B of the Constitution uh, has a way of giving, bringing in an immediacy. It gives, uh, yes, it says that the government can um, progressively realize as provided for under Article 21, but it talks about urgency of, of uh, certain, certain rights, particularly rights, prioritization of rights that relates to vulnerable groups, and it leads those uh, vulnerable groups. And so this gives um, that understanding that, noting the delay, that, that the uh, drafters are quite aware about the delay that can take place when you talk about progressive realization. And that is why they put within the constitution itself um, some mechanism or some frameworks that even though it is uh, progressively realizable, there should be a plan. And that plan should prioritize vulnerable groups, such as women, persons with disabilities, the youth, the elderly, the list um, goes on. So yeah, thank you. So we have time for probably one last question before closing remarks from... Um, can you hear me? Can yeah, you hear we me? can still hear you and see you, no problem. You're still very much here, so don't, don't worry. Yes. Um, and it, so Megan, uh, there's a question that wasn't answered about the person who asked about whether controversial uh, issues and rights such as sexual orientation should be handled by courts or legislate the legislature. So uh, I discussed that in the book and I talk about constitutional morality and that should be the guiding principle. And uh, we've, we've seen this, I discussed some of the Kenyan cases that have come up and the courts, the high court has emphasized about constitutional morality. And that is why uh, Kenyans in agreeing to the transgender constitution set in place the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights has rights for, for various groups. It gives gaps that then are supposed to be uh, then handled by the courts. And that is because as they relate to minor rights of minorities, which are quite sensitive and might be um, sucked out by the views of the majority. So for instance, in my book, I recommend the courts to deal with issues, particularly as they relate to minority groups, to just ensure that there is that spirit in terms of constitutional morality. So constitutional morality is just 
the constitution interpreting uh, rights with regards to what is within the four corners of the constitution rather than public opinion to be able to safeguard the rights of minority groups. Thank you. I heartily concur with, with your answer there. Um, we have two final questions. I'm going to pose one and then I'll, I'll uh, flip to uh, my co moderator Duncan, for the sec second. Both we're going to direct first to Professor Ambani. So they're directed to one source uh, and then we'll give Vicky a chance to respond. My question comes from the, the YouTube uh, uh, comment box is asking, how do the backgrounds of the writers of the constitution influence the right to equality that we currently see in the constitution. So what do the backgrounds of drafters bring to constitutional drafting and constitutional formations of the right to equality? And I'll flip to Duncan for our, our last, last question. So Megan, can I answer that? Yeah, answer that. And then we'll, uh, Professor Ambani will also have a chance to answer it within okay. four minutes left. Yeah, so draft us to the constitution. Um, Christina, we should have asked when she was around <laughs> because she was one of the drafters. So you can, you can have a sense that uh, Christina Murray being one of the drafters of the Trenton constitution, having a background as a professor in South Africa and uh, also now seeing that uh, the Kenyan constitution borrows a lot from the South African uh, constitution, uh, but then rec reconciles that with the Kenyan context. So that tells us that the background of, uh, of uh, drafters also came into play with regards to uh, things that were in the constitution. But as we, you re you'll see in my book, there are things that are many uh, of the provisions are quite Kenyan. So influenced by international um, rights, which as it should be, but then uh, harmonized to be truly Kenyan. Okay, thank you. Professor Ambani, I wonder if we could get your thoughts on the identities of constitutional drafters. Yeah, um, the authors of a constitution always uh, influence it. Um, we are soon launching a book, maybe I can talk about it, in honor of Professor Yash Pargai. I, I am one of the editors. I hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Okay, yeah. I'm saying we are soon launching a book uh, in honor of our greatest law scholar, uh, Professor Yash Pargai, um, and I'm one of the editors. And one of the observations uh, I make uh, in my contribution is actually titled The Guy in Our Constitution, my chapter, The Guy in Our Constitution. Um, I make that our constitution was influenced a lot by Professor Guy. Um, and uh, you can see uh, that he inspired Kenyans uh, to begin to see solutions to some of the problems that Kenyans had had. Um, and for me, I can clearly say that the authors had an impact on what the constitution eventually was. Uh, but that's just one. Um, I think there's also very much, um, you know, in the environment of the constitution that influenced it. Um, I think South Africa was a good model for us. Um, for those who will remember, our liberation struggles had tallied uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the, our second liberation had tallied with South Africa's, um, you know, post-apartheid, uh, you know, agitations. And we sort of admired South Africa, uh, mostly because of uh, Mandela and the early constitutional framework that was quite progressive. And that explains why our constitution borrows heavily from South Africa. Uh, we are also a British colony. And, and the, the thing about the colonized is that they get attached to the colonizers. Um, and our constitution borrows heavily, of course, uh, from the common law tradition. And you will see a lot of that. Uh, a lot of borrowing from the US as well, um, and, and so forth and so on. Um, there, was, there was also a lot of global consensus, for example, in areas such as human rights that had been emerging, uh, women rights, uh, rights of persons with disability, uh, minority rights protection, all those uh, had to be accommodated in the constitution uh, because our constitution is not an island and we are not an island as a people. But allow me to stress finally on the point that uh, Dr. Miandazi said. In, in, uh, in, in my book, um, the, the first book I wrote on the constitution, just basic introduction uh, to my first year class, 
I defined our constitution as autochthonous. to us. Um, in that I meant uh, that the constitution appeared to be very homegrown, appeared to be very much alive to some realities that we had faced as a people. Um, I could give two illustrations. Uh, one, um, the requirement that nobody's image will be on our currency. I tell my students that a foreigner coming to Kenya would wonder why that was a constitutional item. Uh, why would you say uh, or describe how your currency will look? But it's because our leaders have not been um, unifying the, the presidents that we have had. Uh, they are, it is contested whether they are in fact well-meaning since independence. Um, many times they represent very parochial interests of their tribes or ethnic groups. And their, their being on currency continues the division. And so we decided that we shall not have a single human being on the currency. Of course, has been floated, uh, just like the gender issues have. Uh, the other one, and this is the most interesting one uh, that Professor uh, Yash Guy Draft had, um, it tended to define how the swearing in of the president will be. It said it shall be in a public place. It said it shall be during the day. Of course, it has been edited a bit. Now it's just said in a public place. But again, a foreigner from Mass coming to Kenya will be at pains to understand why we had to say, for example, in a public place during the day or during these hours. And, and the reason was, especially for the initial draft, um, that we had a president in at a time no one understands, till today. I have no idea when President Kibaki was sworn in for his second term. I have no idea what time it was. I have no idea where it was. Of course, it appears to be state house, but it's all just rumors. It was hurriedly done in a private residence of the president, uh, of course, private public because it's a state house, but where the ordinary Kenyan does not access. So from that time on, you see a constitution being very deliberate, uh, being very precise and spot on uh, to address a particular problem. And one can go on and on, habeas corpus, torture, all those. We have a history of those violations and the constitution had to speak about them specifically um, going forward. And I think that then explains the, the, the content of our constitution. So it was many, many, um, many things informing it, if you ask me. Thank you. If I may take over from uh, uh, there and just make up a follow-up question uh, to Professor Ambani. Uh, had you been given an opportunity, if you had the chance, like the one Victoria had, to write a book on equality in Kenya's 2010 constitution, and you uh, decided to have a comparative uh, approach to it, like she did in some aspects, would you rather consult jurisdictions like um, Equatorial Guinea, uh, like Nigeria, Malawi, and Uganda, than to look at uh, the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, South Africa, India, and Botswana, as Victoria did? And as you answer that, in you know, our bid to get more indigenous in our conceptualization of uh, ideas and um, as we answer that, maybe Victoria could also uh, dispel any disquiet um, on the comparative logic that you used to uh, to move to UK and Canada and South Africa uh, instead of having Malawi, Equatorial Guinea, and uh, Senegal as your comparative uh, your, your countries for comparison. Yeah. I knew that Dr. Okubasu would harass me a bit. <laughs> I expected it. I almost thought I would get away with it, uh, but it's fine. Um, looking at the fact that our constitution borrows heavily from those jurisdictions, we learn a thing from Canada, a thing from South Africa, a thing from the UK, a thing from the US. It made sense. Um, now, I'm talking as a supervisor. Um, and then actually, Professor uh, Friedman, you did a great job. Um, I think I would have insisted that she also does comparative studies uh, in those particular jurisdictions. Uh, that's fine by me. However, um, the thing I would have done differently would have been to look more at the context. She did a good job, like I said earlier, 
uh, but I would have gone much more there, much more. Um, so for example, she mentions uh, Jomo Kenyatta facing Mount Kenya. She refers to it. Um, Jomo Kenyatta talks about, let me talk about two things he talks about that are quite exciting and uh, quite uh, uh, disturbing as well. One is sex among youth, among the Kikuyu. Okay. Um, and he says, there's a way they would do it. There are Kikuyu names for it. Um, you can look for that book. Um, not penetrative, just intercourse and fun, and it taught them how to be uh, resilient, how to resist temptations, um, and it was allowed. Those youth who are not necessarily above 18. Such kind of conduct under the Sexual Offenses Act would be seriously criminal, would land you in jail for more than 20 years, you know? Um, Kenyatta mentions that the missionaries were not happy with it, they had misinterpreted it, and that they had changed Kikuyu um, to, to, to reflect it badly. Even the Kikuyu word eventually got a negative connotation. I think it's Rua or something, what is it? Um, second, Jomo Kenyatta mentions also uh, female circumcision. And he talks about it very positively. Uh, something Gugi Wationgo also does, but of course Gugi introduces dilemma, but Kenyatta talks about female circumcision, not as uh, mutilation, but as circumcision. And he talks about how it should be seen in the bigger context of society. Um, the, you know, how everyone enjoys that custom. It's not just about the genitalia as it was, uh, but much more about belonging to that community and enjoying um, uh, being part of society. What I would have uh, requested me and does it to do if I was a supervisor or if I was the one writing is to engage a little bit more with that. How do I reconcile African customs with emerging global standards, for example, in the area of human rights, uh, without uh, being too much westernized? Um, remember, the Bill of Rights we have can be accused of being sourced from the Western sources. Um, if I went, for example, the Twail approach, uh, third world approach to international law, for example. Uh, the bills of rights we have are clearly word for word with the international standards which Africans have contested in other fora. So I would have engaged much more there than just, uh, for example, learning from other jurisdictions. I think Okubasu, that's where uh, my work would have dwelt more if I was the one writing in that context. And it would be interesting to see how I resolve Kenyatta's concern uh, that the Kikuyu culture was disappearing and the missionary's concern that the African culture is backward in a modern and ever-changing society where my son has to define himself. Uh, my son, for example, is 10 years old, has to define himself and see what is good and what is wrong and what lenses would they then use to find that FGM is bad or sex is bad or good, uh, you, you know? Uh, that, that's really where I would have developed my efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so to I just briefly add on to that, I look at that in chapter uh, chapter two of the of the book, uh, and I discuss as well uh, in depth about compar comparative applying comparative approaches, and I justify why I picked the various jurisdictions. Mainly, it's because of uh, the borrowing from the South African Constitution, which also borrowed from the Canadian um, Bill of Fundamental the the Rights um, Charter, and it also borrowed from the the South African um, the United States approach, as well as from other jurisdictions that I justify and I give a description of why. And then with regards to that, I also give how I reconcile the various approaches. I say that uh, it's, not all, only, it's not about cherry picking, and also it's all about making sure that all of the comparative jurisprudence that is cited is um, looked, on a, looked at on a contextual approach. So context is quite big in the book. In the book. I talk about, uh, whenever I talk about a particular right, I look at the context and I look at the comparative approaches and I say, how do they, do they marry well or what should change? So I look at the genealogical justification, genealogy being uh, what is the, the, the genealogy of our constitution. It borrows from this, from that, and so on. What is the universal approach? So. Uh, human rights are universal rights. When, you, when uh, a foreigner comes to Kenya, they have the same rights that they have in, the, in a different country. 
as much as that, that is just when you talk about human rights. And then specifically, we have um, Kenyan specific contextual rights that I look at with regards to culture and religion and how to reconcile that with universal human rights. And so that is the approach. And then also dialogic approach, which is just um, dialogue that uh, uh, scholars and courts can have a dialogue with the, looking at comparative law and dialogue with it and find is comparative law applicable in just showing that uh, how they arrived at a particular decision and debunking some of the comparative jurisprudence. So there is a, a big, with regards to the whole chapter, it's not just chapter six, it, there's a lot of discussion about context. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that very rich discussion. Thank you everyone for sending in those really, really hard and insightful and um, thought-provoking questions. And so for our last, uh, I guess, speaker, we'll turn to uh, Dr. Anne McKenna, who is the program coordinator for the Africa Oxford Initiative in Oxford, for all things Africa and Oxford. So I'll turn the floor over to her for uh, some brief concluding remarks. And thank you so much. For a complete non-lawyer in the group, actually the polar opposite of lawyers, I am I am been absolutely thrilled to be part of this conversation, sitting in the background, just listening. Very interesting. And as always, it's good to see Professor Ambani poking, um, poking holes into everything that we hold dear. <laughs> Such a joy. Brilliant. Thank you very much for inviting us and for, for welcoming us to be part of your journey, Victoria. we um, at Africa Oxford Initiative, as, as Megan has said, we try to bring in all sorts of interesting uh, conversation about Africa um, across the university and actually across uh, all the disciplines. And then it's brilliant to be part of, uh, of this conversation today. So my job really is very simple. Paul is to just say thank you, Asante Nisana. Um, a big thank you to, to the panelists that we've had really brilliant uh, remarks on both sides. Uh, it's, it's beautiful to see uh, you know, perspectives from such different legal scholars, but still marrying um, the ideas from your book really brilliantly. So thank you so much for taking the time and for bringing in your best brains to this conversation. A big thank you to our very fantastic moderators who did a brilliant job of, of gelling in between the conversations and bringing us all to speed, those of us who are completely out of the loop. So thank you very much. And of course, a massive thank you to all the audiences that have joined us in on YouTube, on Facebook Live, on all the different platforms and continue to share your questions and, and the very invigorating conversations happening happening in the chat boxes. Now, I want to uh, really, at this point, close by saying a, a really great, a big thank you to, to Victoria for, for bringing us here today, for giving us an opportunity, a window to her scholarship, not just, um, as, as somebody said in the, in the comments, not just uh, theoretical ways of thinking about equality, but really practical um, aspects of it. Real lives people are at stake and it's brilliant to see you bring this to the fore, talking about real life experiences and how that is enshrined in our constitution. One thing that I took away at some point was um, the constitution seems to be giving us with one hand and taking away with 10. I don't know where we're gonna end up in the end. Um, it would be brilliant to see how this scholarship emerges uh, going forward and, and what new things arise in the wave of BBI and all this other political drama, as somebody has mentioned earlier, earlier in the discussions. So thank you so much for giving us a window into the problems and, and, the, and the challenges of, of, of equality in, in the Kenyan context. And, and we are delighted that we, we've been part of this book launch. And more importantly, we are excited about where, where things are going moving forward. Uh, with that said, thank you very much, Asante Nisana. And, and we look forward to continuing with the conversation on our social media. Thank you so Thank much, you. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, and bye bye. Bye bye, everyone. Thank bye you, bye Anne. everyone. And thank you, everyone, for participating. Uh, this one small housekeeping thing for those listening uh, on the YouTube chat, there is a link to Victoria's book. There's also a 20% discount code, which is UG6. So if you've listened to all this and thought, I need to read more, uh, you can read more with 20% off at UG6 if you uh, go to the link on to Victoria's book on the YouTube chat. Uh, this concludes the book launch. Thank you to everyone again for participating and have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you to everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye. McKenna, bye. <laughs>